seat. Good, Tamra said tiredly. Send the novice on duty is named Ellen. Send Ellen in to me. I'll tell her where to find Gitara's woman. And make sure that Ellen had heard nothing through the closed door, obviously. Otherwise the task would have been Swans or Moiraines. When the girl comes in, the two of you may go. And remember, not a word. Not one. The emphasis only drove home the peculiarity. An order from the Amberlin seat was to be obeyed as if on oath. There was no need to emphasize anything. I wished to hear a foretelling, Warren thought as she made her final curtsy before leaving. And what I received was a foretelling of doom. Now she wished very much that she had been more careful of what she wished for. Chapter 3. Practice. The wide corridor outside the Armalyn's apartments was as cold as her sitting room had been and full of drafts. Some were strong enough to ripple one or another of the long, heavy tapestries on the white marble walls. Atop the gilded stand lamps between the bright wall hangings, the flames flickered, nearly blown out. The novices would be at their breakfast at this hour, and likely most of the other accepted, too. For the moment, the hallways were empty, save for Swan and Moiraine. They walked along the Blue Runner, half the width of the corridor, taking advantage of the small protection the carpet gave from the chill of the floor tiles, a repeating pattern in the colors of all seven ajas. Moiraine was too stunned to speak. The faint sound of the trumpets still sounding barely registered on her. They turned the corner into a hallway where the floor tiles were white, the runner green. To their right, another wide, tapestry-hung corridor lined with stand lamps spiraled gently upward toward the Aja's quarters, the visible portion floored in blue and yellow, with a runner patterned in grey and brown and red. Inside each Aja's quarters, the Aja's own color predominated, and some others might be missing altogether. But in the communal areas of the tower, the colors of all the Aja's were used in equal proportion. Irrelevant thoughts drifted through her head. Why equal when some Ajas were larger than others? Had they once been the same size? How could that have been achieved? A newly raised Aes Sedai chose her Aja freely, yet each Aja had quarters of the same size. Irrelevant thoughts were better than... Do you want breakfast? Swan said. Moiraine gave a small start of surprise. Breakfast? I could not swallow a bite, Swan. The other woman shrugged. I have no appetite myself. I just thought I'd keep you company if you wanted something. I am going back to my room and try to get a little sleep, if I can settle myself. I have a novice class in two hours. And likely more classes to teach today, if the sisters did not start returning soon. Novices could not miss classes for little things like battles or... She did not want to think about the or. She would miss lessons too if the Eyes Sedai failed to return. Accepted studied on their own for the most part, but she had a private class scheduled with Mylan Sedai and another with Larella Sedai. Sleep would be wasting time we don't have, Swan said firmly. We'll practice for the testing. We might have almost a month, but it could be tomorrow just as easily. We cannot be sure we will be tested any time soon. Marian just said she thought we were close. Swan snorted, loudly. While she was still a novice, the sisters had cleaned up her language, which had been strongly redolent of the docks and often rough with it, but they still had not managed to smooth away all the edges of her, which was just as well. Rough edges were a part of Swan. When Marian says someone is close, she tests within the month, and you know it, Moiraine. We'll practice. Moiraine sighed. She did not really believe she could sleep, not now, but she doubted she could concentrate very well either. Practice took concentration. Oh, all right, Swan. The second surprise, after their friendship, had been the realization that between them, the fisherman's daughter led and the noblewoman followed. Of course, rank in the outside world carried no rights inside the tower. There had been two daughters of beggars who rose to be Amarlin's seat, 
as well as daughters of merchants and farmers and craftsfolk, including three daughters of cobblers, but only one daughter of a ruler. Besides, Moiraine had been taught to judge people's capabilities long before she left home. In the Sun Palace especially, you began learning that as soon as you were old enough to walk. Swan had been born to lead. It felt surprisingly natural to follow where Swan led. I wager you will be in the Hall of the Tower by the time you have worn the shawl a hundred years, and Amerlin before fifty more, she said, not for the first time. It brought the same reaction it always did. Don't ill wish me, Swan said with a scowl. I intend to see the world. Maybe parts of it no other sister has seen. I used to watch the ships sail into tear full of silk and ivory from Shara, and I'd wonder if any of the crew had had the nerve to sneak outside the trade ports. I would have. Her face matched Tamra's for determination. Once my father took his boat all the way down river to the Sea of Storms, and I could hardly pull on the nets for staring south, wondering what lay beyond the horizon. I'll see it one day. And the Arith Ocean. Who knows what lies west of the Arith Ocean? Strange lands with strange customs. Maybe cities as great as Tarvalon, and mountains higher than the spine of the world. Just think about it, Moiraine. Just think. Moiraine suppressed a smile. Swan was so fierce about her intended adventures, though she would never call them that. Adventures were what took place in stories and books, not in life, as Swan would point out to anyone who used the word. Without a doubt, though, once she had the shawl, she would be off like an arrow leaving the bow. And then they might see one another twice in ten years, if not longer. That brought a pang of sadness, but she did not doubt that her own predictions would come true as well. It did not take foretelling. No, that was thinking in the wrong direction. As they turned another corner and walked past a narrow marble staircase leading down, Swan's scowl faded, and she began studying Moiraine in sidelong glances. The floor tiles here were a vivid green, the runner deep yellow, and the white walls were plain and bare. The stand lamps were not gilded in this part of the tower, which was used more by servants than sisters. You're trying to change the subject, aren't you? Swan said abruptly. Which subject? Moiraine asked, half laughing. Practice or breakfast? You know what subject, Moiraine. What do you think about it? The bubble of laughter vanished. There was no need to ask what it was. Exactly the thing that she did not want to think about. He is born again. She could hear Gitara's voice in her head. The dragon takes his first breath. Her shiver had nothing to do with the cold this time. For more than 3,000 years, the world had waited on the prophecies of the dragon to be fulfilled, fearing them, yet knowing they told of the world's only hope. And now a boy child was about to be born, very soon, perhaps, by the way Gitara had spoken, to bring those prophecies to a conclusion. He would be born on the slopes of Dragon Mount, reborn where it was said the man he had once been had died. Three thousand years ago and more, the Dark One had almost broken free into the world of humankind and brought on the War of the Shadow, which had ended only with the breaking of the world. Everything had been destroyed, the very face of the earth changed, humanity reduced to ragged refugees. Centuries passed before the simple struggle for survival gave way to building cities and nations once more. That infant's birth meant the Dark One would break free again, for the child would be born to face the Dark One in Tarman Gaiden, the last battle. On him rested the fate of the world. The prophecies said he was the only chance. They did not say he would win. Maybe worse than the thought of his defeat, though, was the fact that he would channel Sidene, the male half of the One Power. Moiraine did not shiver at that. She shuddered. Sidene bore the Dark One's taint. Men still tried to channel from time to time. Some actually managed to teach themselves and survived learning without a teacher. No easy feat. Among women, only one in four survived trying to learn on their own. Some of those men caused wars, 
usually false dragons, men who claimed to be the dragon reborn, while others attempted to hide in ordinary lives. But unless they were caught and brought to Tarvalin to be gentled, cut off from the power forever, every one of them went mad. That could take years, or just months, yet it was inevitable. Madmen, who could tap into the one power that turned the wheel of time and drove the universe. The histories were full of the horrors men like that had done. And the prophecies said that the Dragon Reborn would bring a new breaking of the world. Would his victory be any better than a victory by the Dark One? Yes. Yes, it must be. Even the breaking had left people alive to rebuild, eventually. The Dark One would leave only a charnel house. And in any case, prophecies did not turn aside for the wishes of accepted. Not for the prayers of nations. What I think is that the Armalyn told us not to talk about it, she said. Swan shook her head. She told us not to tell anyone else. Since we already know, it must be all right for us to talk about it between us. She cut off as a stout serving woman with the white flame of Tarvalin on her breast appeared around a corner just ahead of them. As the round woman walked past, she peered down her long nose at them suspiciously. Perhaps they looked guilty. Male servants often turned a blind eye to what accepted and even novices got up to. Perhaps they wanted no more involvement with Aes Sedai than their jobs entailed. Female servants, on the other hand, kept as close a watch as the sisters themselves. As long as we're careful, Swan breathed, once the liveried woman was beyond earshot. However certain she was that talking between themselves was all right, she seemed content to say no more until they reached the Accepted's quarters, in the tower's western wing. There, stone-railed galleries in a hollow well surrounded a small garden three levels below. The garden was only a handful of evergreen bushes poking through the snow at this time of year. An Accepted, who put her feet too far wrong, might find herself clearing away that snow with a shovel. The sisters were great believers that physical labor built character. But no one had gotten into that much trouble lately. Resting her hands on the railing, Moiraine peered up at the bright winter morning sky, past the six silent rows of galleries above. Her breath made a white mist in front of her face. The trumpets were more audible here than in the hallways the stink of smoke stronger in the air. There were rooms for over a hundred accepted in this well, and the same in a second well, too. Perhaps the numbers would not have come to mind now except for Gitara's foretelling, yet she had thought about them before. They were etched in her brain as if with acid. Space for above two hundred accepted, but the second well had been shut up since time out of memory for any living eyes to die, and barely more than sixty of these rooms were occupied. The novices' quarters also had two wells, with rooms for almost four hundred girls, but one of these was long closed, too, and the other held under a hundred. She had read that once novices and accepted had both been housed two to a room. Once, half the girls who were entered in the novice book had been tested for the ring, Fewer than twenty of the current novices would be allowed to. The tower had been built to house three thousand sisters, but only four hundred and twenty-three were in residence at the moment, with perhaps twice as many more scattered across the nations, numbers that still burned like acid. No eyes said I would say it aloud, and she would never dare say it where a sister might hear, but the White Tower was failing. The tower was failing and the last battle was coming. You worry too much, Swan said gently. My father used to say, change what you can if it needs changing, but learn to live with what you can't change. You'll only get a sick stomach otherwise. That was me, not my father. With another snort, she gave an overdone shiver and wrapped her arms around herself. Can we get inside now? I'm freezing. My room is closest. Come on. Moiraine nodded. The tower taught its students to live with what they could not change, too. But some things were important enough to try, even if you were sure to fail. That had been one of her lessons as a child. Except its rooms were identical, except in detail, slightly wider at the back than at the door, with plain wall panels of dark wood. 
None of the furnishings were fine, or indeed anything a sister would have tolerated. There was a small square Tarabonna rug woven in faded blue and green stripes on Swan's floor, and the mirrored washstand in the corner held a chipped white pitcher sitting in the wash basin. Accepted were required to make do, unless something actually broke, and if it broke, they had best have a good explanation why. The small table with three leather-bound books stacked on it and the two ladder-back chairs could have come from a penniless farmer's house, but Swan's slept-in bed with its tumbled blankets was wide, like something from a moderately prosperous farmhouse. A small wardrobe completed the furnishings. Nothing was carved or ornamented in any way. When Moiraine had moved from the small, stark room of a novice, she had felt as if she were moving into a palace though the chamber was half the size of any room in her apartments in the Sun Palace. Best of all, at the moment, was the fireplace of dressed grey stone. Today, any room with a fireplace would seem a palace, if she could stand near it. Swan hastily moved three pieces of split wood to the fire irons on the hearth. The wood box was almost empty. Serving men brought Aes Sedai their firewood, but accepted had to carry theirs up themselves then grunted when she discovered that her efforts at banking the coals of last night's fire had failed. No doubt in a hurry to reach the Amerlin's chambers, she had not covered them with ashes well enough to stop them from burning out. A frown creased her forehead for a moment, and then Warren felt that small tingle again as the light of Sidar briefly surrounded the other woman. Any woman who could channel could feel another wielding the power if she was close enough, but the tingle was unusual. Women who spent a lot of time together in their training sometimes felt it, but the sensation was supposed to fade away over time. Hers and Swan's never had. Sometimes Moiraine thought it was a sign of how close their friendship was. When the glow winked out, the short lengths of log were burning merrily. Moiraine said nothing, but Swan gave her a look as if she had delivered a speech. I was too cold to wait, Moiraine, she said defensively. Besides, you must remember a Karen's lecture two weeks ago. You must know the rules to the letter, she quoted, and live with them before you can know which rules you may break and when. That says right out that sometimes you can break the rules. A Karen, a slender brown with quick eyes to catch who was not following her, had been lecturing about being eyes Sedai, not accepted. But Moiraine held her tongue. Swan had not needed the lecture to think about breaking rules. Oh, she never broke the major strictures. She never tried to run away or was disrespectful to a sister or anything of that sort, and she would never think of stealing. But she had had a liking for pranks from the start. Well, Moiraine did, too. Most accepted did, at least now and then, and some novices as well. Playing jokes was a way to relieve the strain of constant study with few free days. Accepted had no chores beyond those necessary to keep themselves and their rooms tidy, unless they got into trouble at least, but they were expected to work hard at their studies, harder than novices dreamed of. Some relief was needed, or you would crack like an egg dropped on stone. Nothing she and Swan had done was malicious, of course. Washing a hated Accepted's shift with Itch Oak did not count. Elida had made their first year as novices a misery, setting standards for them that no one could have met, yet insisting they be met. The second year after she gained the shawl had been worse until she left the tower. Most of their pranks had been much more benign, though even the most innocent could bring swift punishment, especially if the target was an eyes Sedai. Their major triumph had been filling the largest fountain in the water garden with fat green trout one night the previous summer. Major in part because of the difficulty, and in part because they had escaped discovery. A few sisters had directed suspicious looks at them, but luckily no one could prove they had done it. Luckily, asking them whether they had was simply not done with accepted. Putting trout in the fountain might not have brought a visit to the Mistress of Novices' study, but leaving the tower grounds without permission in order to buy them, and worse, at night, surely would have. Moiraine hoped that Swan was not building up to a prank with this talk of breaking rules. She herself was too tired. They were bound to be caught. 
Will you go first or shall I? She asked. Maybe the practice would take Swan's mind off getting into trouble. You need the practice more. We'll concentrate on you this morning. And this afternoon. And tonight. Moiraine grimaced, but it was true. The test for the shawl consisted of creating 100 different weaves perfectly and in a precise order while under great stress. And it was necessary to display complete calm the entire time. Exactly what that stress would be, they did not know, except that attempts would be made to distract them and to break their composure. For practice, they provided the distractions for each other, and Swan was very good at throwing her off at the worst moment, or provoking her temper. Too much temper and you could not hold on to Sidar at all. Even after her six years of work at it, her channeling required at least a degree of calm. Swan could seldom be unsettled, and her temper was held with an iron grip. Embracing the true source, Moiraine let Sidar fill her. Not as much of it as she could hold, but enough for practicing. Channeling was tiring work, and the more of the power you channeled, the worse. Even that tiny amount spread through her, filling her with joy and life, with exultation. The wonder of it was near to torment. When she had first embraced Sidar, she had not known whether to weep or laugh. She immediately felt the urge to draw more and forced the desire down. All of her senses were clearer, sharper with the power in her. She thought she could almost hear Swan's heart beating. She could feel the currents of air moving against her face and hands, and the colors banding her friend's dress were more vivid, the white of the wool whiter. She could make out tiny cracks in the wall panels that she could not have seen without putting her nose against the wall, lacking the power that suffused her totally. It was exhilarating. She felt more alive. Part of her wished she could hold Sidar every waking moment, but that was strictly prohibited. That desire could lead to drawing more and more, until eventually you drew more than you could handle. And that either killed you, or else burned the ability to channel out of you. Losing this bliss would be much worse than death. Swan took one of the chairs, and the glow enveloped her. Moiraine could not see the light around herself, of course. Weaving a ward against eavesdropping around the inside of the room, flat against walls and floor and ceiling, Swan tied it off so she did not have to maintain it. Holding two weaves at once was more than twice as taxing as one, three more than twice as wearing as two. Beyond that, difficult no longer sufficed as a description, though it could be done. She motioned for Moiraine to turn her back. With a frown for the ward, Moiraine complied. It would be easy to avoid distraction if she could see the weaves Swan was preparing for her. But why ward against eavesdropping? Someone with an ear pressed to the door would hear nothing if she screamed at the top of her lungs. Surely Swan would not do anything to make her scream. No, it had to be the first part of trying to unsettle her, by making her wonder over it. She felt Swan handling flows, earth and air, then fire, water and spirit, then earth and spirit, always changing. Without looking, there was no way to tell whether the other woman was creating a weave or just trying another diversion. Taking a deep breath, she concentrated on utter calm. Most of the weaves in the test were extremely complex and had been designed solely for the test. Oddly, none required any gestures, which a good many weaves did. The motion was not really part of the weave, except that if you did not make it, the weave did not work. Supposedly, the gestures set certain pathways in your mind. The lack of gestures made it seem possible that you might lack the use of your hands during at least part of the test, and that sounded ominous. Another oddity was that none of those incredibly intricate weaves actually did anything, and even done incorrectly, they would not produce anything dangerous. Not too dangerous, anyway. That was a very real possibility with a number of weaves. Some of the simplest could prove disastrous, done just a little off. Women had died in the testing, but obviously not from bungling a weave. Still, a mistake with the first could yield a deafening thunderclap. 
she channeled very thin flows of air, weaving them just so. This was a fairly simple weave, but you could not force Sidar, no matter how small the threads. The power was like a vast river, flowing inexorably onward. Try to force it, and you would be swept away like a twig on the river Aranin. You had to use its overwhelming strength to guide it as you wanted. In any case, size was not specified, and small was less work. And the noise would be smaller if Swan managed to... Moiraine. Do you think the Reds will be able to make themselves leave him alone? Moiraine gave a jerk, even before the weave she was making produced a boom like a kettle drum. Any sister was expected to deal with a man who could channel if she encountered one, but Reds concentrated on hunting them down. Swan meant the boy child. That explained the ward, and maybe the talk of breaking rules. Maybe Swan was not so sure as she pretended that Tamra would not care if they discussed the child between themselves. Moiraine glared over her shoulder. Don't stop, Swan said calmly. She was still channeling, but not doing anything beyond handling the flows. You really do need practice if you fumbled that one. Well, do you? About the reds? This time, the weave produced a silver-blue disc the size of a small coin that dropped into Moiraine's outstretched hand. The shape was not specified either, another oddity, but discs and balls were easiest. Woven of air yet hard as steel, it felt slightly cold. She released the weave and the coin vanished, leaving only a residue of the power that would soon fade away as well. The next weave was one of the complex and useless sort, requiring all of the five powers, but Moiraine answered as she wove it. She could talk and channel at the same time, after all. Air and fire so, and earth thus, spirit, then air once more. She wove without stopping. For some reason you could not hold these weaves only partly done for very long, or they collapsed into something else entirely. Spirit again, then fire and earth together. They will have twenty years to learn how, or nearly so at worst. At best, they will have longer. Girls sometimes, if rarely, began channeling as young as twelve or thirteen if they were born with the spark. But even with the spark, boys never did before eighteen or nineteen unless they tried to learn how. And in some men, the spark did not come out until they were as old as thirty. Air again, then spirit and water, all placed precisely. Besides, he will be the Dragon Reborn. Even the Reds will have to see that he cannot be gentled until after he fights the last battle. A grim fate. To save the world if he could, then for reward be cut off from this wonder. Prophecy was not known for mercy any more than for yielding to prayers. Earth again, then fire, then more air. The thing was beginning to look like the most hopeless knot in the world. Will that be enough? I've heard some Reds don't try all that hard to take those poor men alive. She'd heard that too, but it was only a rumor, and a violation of Tower Law. A sister could be birched for it, and likely exiled to a secluded farm to think on her crime for a time. It should be counted as murder, but given what those men would do unrestrained, she could almost see why it was not. More spirit laid down, and earth threaded through. Invisible fingers seemed to run up her sides to her armpits. She was ticklish, as Swan knew well, but the other woman would need to do better than that. She barely flinched. As someone told me not long ago, learn to live with what you cannot change, she said wryly. The wheel of time weaves as the wheel wills, and Ajas do what they do. Move air and fire like so, followed by water, earth, and spirit, then all five at once. Liked what a ghastly tangle, and not done yet. What I think, Swan began, and the door banged open, letting in a surge of freezing air that swept away all the warmth of the fire. With Sidar filling her, her awareness heightened, Moiraine felt suddenly covered with a coat of ice from head to toe. The door also let in Mirel Berengari, an accepted from Altara who had earned the ring in the same year as they. Olive-skinned and beautiful and almost as tall as Swan, Mirel was gregarious and also mercurial, 
with a boisterous sense of humor and a temper even worse than Moiraine's when she let it go. The two of them had begun with heated words as novices that got them both switched, and had somehow found themselves friends. Oh, not so close as Swan and she, but still friends. The only reason she did not snap at the other accepted for walking in without knocking. Not that they would have heard if she had pounded with the ward set. Not that that mattered. There was the principle of the thing. How long before the last battle, do you think? Mirelle asked, shutting the door. She took in the half-completed weave in front of Moraine and the ward around the room, and a grin appeared on her lips. Practicing for the test, I see. Have you been making her squeal, Swan? I can help if you like. I know a sure way to make her squeal like a piglet caught in a net. Moiraine hurriedly let the weave dissipate before it could collapse, and exchanged confused looks with Swan. How could Mirelle know? I did not squeal like... In the way you said, she said primly, playing for time. Most Accepted's pranks were aimed at other Accepted, and Mirelle's numbers almost matched hers and Swan's. That particular one had involved ice in the depths of summer heat, when even shade felt like an oven. But she had not sounded anything like a piglet. What do you mean, Morel? Swan asked cautiously. Why, the Aiel, of course. What else could I mean? Moiraine exchanged another look with Swan, of chagrin this time. A number of sisters claimed that various passages in the Prophecies of the Dragon referred to the Aiel. Of course, just as many said they did not. At the beginning of the war, there had been rather animated discussions about the matter. They would have been called shouting arguments if the women involved had not been Aes Sedai. But with what they knew now, all of that had slipped right out of Moiraine's head, and plainly out of Swan's as well. Keeping their knowledge hidden was going to take constant vigilance. The pair of you have a secret, don't you? Mirelle said. I don't know anybody for having secrets like you two. Well, don't think I'll ask, because I won't. By her expression, she was dying to ask. It isn't ours to tell, Swan replied, and Moiraine's eyebrows climbed before she could control her face. What was Swan up to? Was she trying to play Desdemar? Moiraine had tried to teach her how the game of houses worked. In Kyrian, even servants and farmers knew how to maneuver for advantage and deflect others from their own plans and secrets. In Kyrian, nobles and commoners alike lived by Desdemar, more so than anywhere else, and the game was played everywhere, even in lands where everyone denied it. For all Moiraine's efforts, though, Swan had never shown much facility. She was just too straightforward. But you can help me with Moiraine, the woman went on, even more surprisingly. Their practice was always just the two of them. She knows my tricks too well by now. Laughing, Mirelle rubbed her hands together gleefully and took the second chair, the light of the power springing up around her. Grimly, Moiraine turned her back again and took up the second weave, but Swan said, From the beginning, Moiraine. You know better. You have to have the order fixed in your head so firmly that nothing can make you fumble it. With a small sigh, Moiraine produced the silver-blue coin of air once more, then moved on. Swan was right, in a way, about her knowing Swan's tricks. Swan liked to use tickles at the worst possible moment, sudden pokes in unpleasant places, embarrassing caresses and startling noises right beside her ear. That, and saying the most shocking things she could think of, and she had a vivid imagination even after the sisters' work with her language. Knowing the other woman's tricks did not make it any easier to hold on to complete composure, though. She had to start over twice because of Swan. Mirelle was worse. She liked ice. Ice was easy to make, a matter of using water and fire to draw it out of the air. But Moiraine would like to see how Morel managed to make it materialize inside her dress, in the worst places. Mirelle also channeled flows to make sly pinches and sharp flicks, as if Moiraine had been snapped with a switch, and sometimes a solid blow across her bottom like the fall of a strap. They were real pinches and real blows. The bruises they left were real, too. Once, Mirelle lifted her a foot off the ground with ropes of air, she was certain it was her. Swan had never done anything like this, 
and slowly rotated her head down and feet pointed toward the ceiling so her skirts fell down over her head. Heart pounding and close to frantic, she pushed her skirts up from in front of her face with her hands. It was not modesty. She had to keep weaving. You could hold a weave without seeing it, but you could not weave. And if this particular bundle of the five powers collapsed, it would give her a painful shock, as though she had scuffled her feet across a carpet and then touched a piece of iron, only three times as bad, and felt all over. She managed to complete that one successfully, but all in all, Mirelle broke her concentration four times. She felt a growing irritation over that, but with herself, not Mirelle. One thing every accepted agreed on was that whatever the sisters did to you in the test would be worse than anything your friends could think of. And if they were your friends, they would do the worst they could think of, short of actual harm, to help you prepare. Light! If Mirelle and Swan could make her fail six times in so short a time, what hope did she have in the actual test? But she kept on with unbending determination. She would pass, and on her first try, she would. She was making that second weave yet again when the door opened once more, and she let the flows vanish, reluctantly let go of Sidar altogether. There was always a reluctance to let go. Life seemed to drain away along with the power. The world became drab. But she would not have had time to finish in any case before her novice class. Except it were not allowed clocks, which were too expensive for most to afford in any event, and the gongs that sounded the hour were not always audible inside the tower, so it was best if you developed a keen sense of time. Except it were no more permitted to be late than novices were. The woman who stood holding the door open was not a friend. Taller than Swan, Tarna Feir was from the north of Altara, close to Andor, but her pale yellow hair was not her only difference from Mirel. Except it were not allowed to be arrogant. It one look into those cold blue eyes told you that she was. She possessed no sense of humor either, and as far as anyone knew, she had never played a joke on anyone. Tarna had gained the ring a year before Swan and Moraine, after nine years as a novice, and she had had few friends as a novice and few now. She did not seem to notice the lack. A very different woman from Mirel. I should have expected to find you two together, she said coolly. There never seemed to be any heat in her. I can't understand why you don't just move into the same room. Are you joining Swan's coterie now, Mirel? All said matter-of-factly, yet Mirel's eyes began to flash. The glow had vanished from Swan, but Mirel still held the power. Moiraine hoped she was not rash enough to use it. Go away, Tarna, Swan said with a quick dismissive gesture. We're busy, and close the door. Tarna did not move. I have to hurry to make my novice class, Moiraine said to Swan. Tarna she ignored. They are just learning how to make a ball of fire, and if I am not there, one of them is sure to try it anyway. Novices were forbidden to channel or even embrace the source without a sister or one of the accepted looking over their shoulders, but they did anyway, given half a chance. New girls never really believed the dangers involved, while the older were always sure they knew how to avoid those dangers. The novices have been given a free day, Tarna said, so no classes today. Being dismissed and ignored did not disconcert her a bit. Nothing did. No doubt Tarna would pass for the shawl on her first try with ease. The accepted are summoned to the Oval Lecture Hall. The Amarlin is going to address us. One other thing you should know. Guitara Moroso died just a few hours ago. The light surrounding Mirel winked out. So that's the secret you were keeping, she exclaimed. Her eyes flashed hotter than they had for Tarna. I told you it wasn't ours to share, Swan replied. An eyes said I answer, if ever there was one. It was enough to make Mirel nod agreement, however reluctantly, and that nod was reluctant. Her eyes did not lose their heat. Moiraine expected that she and Swan might soon have surprising encounters with ice. Still holding the door open, was the woman immune to the cold like a sister? Tarna studied Moiraine and then Swan. That's right, you two would have been in attendance. What happened? All the rest of us have heard is that she died. I was handing her a cup of tea when she gasped and fell dead in my arms, Moiraine replied. 
and that was an even better eyes that I answer than Swan's, every word true while avoiding the whole truth. To her surprise, an expression of sadness crossed Tarna's face. It was fleeting, but it had been there. Tarna never showed emotion. She was carved from stone. Gitara Sadai was a great woman, she murmured. She will be badly missed. Why is the Amarlin going to speak to us? Moiraine asked. Plainly, Gitara's death had already been announced, and by custom her funeral would be tomorrow, so there was no need to announce that. Surely Tamra did not mean to tell the accepted about the foretelling. I don't know, Tarna replied, all coolness once more. But I shouldn't have stood here talking. Everyone else was told to leave breakfast immediately. If we run, we can just make it before the Amarlin arrives. Except it were required to maintain a certain amount of dignity, preparation for the day they reached the shawl. They certainly were never supposed to run unless ordered to. But run they did, Tarna as hard as the rest of them, hiking their skirts to their knees and ignoring the startled looks of liveried servants in the corridors. Aes Sedai did not keep the Amarlin seat waiting. Except it never even thought of it. The oval lecture hall, with its wide scrollwork crown running beneath a gently domed ceiling painted with sky and white clouds, was seldom used. Moiraine and the others were the last of the accepted to arrive, yet the rows of polished wooden benches were less than a quarter filled. The babble of voices, accepted offering suggestions of why the Amarlin would address them, seemed to emphasize how few they were compared to what the chamber had been built to hold. Moiraine put dwindling numbers firmly out of her head. Maybe if the sisters... No, she would not brood. Thankfully, the dais at the front of the hall was still empty. She and Swan found places at the back of the crowd, and Tarna sat beside them, but clearly not with them. The woman wore aloofness like a cloak. Mirel, still in a huff over not being told about Gitara, stalked around to the other end of the row. Half the women in the room seemed to be talking, all on top of one another. It was nearly impossible to make out what anyone in particular was saying, and the little Moiraine did hear was utter nonsense. All of them to be tested for the shawl? Immediately? Aledrin must have brain fever to be spouting such drivel. Well, she was excitable. Brendas was even worse. Normally sensible, she was claiming they were all to be sent home, because Gitara had foretold the end of the White Tower, or maybe of the world, before she died. Likely by noon there would be a dozen tales about Gitara having a foretelling, if there were not more than that already. Rumors grew in the Accepted's quarters like roses in a hothouse, but Moiraine still did not like hearing one. To keep their secret, she was going to have to spin the truth like a top, at least for the next few days. She hoped she was up to it. Does anybody know anything? Swan asked the accepted next to her, a slim, very dark woman with straight black hair hanging to her waist and a scattering of black tattoos on her hands. Or is it all just wind? Zamila regarded her soberly for a moment before saying, Wind, I think. Zamila always took her time. For that matter, she was always sober and thoughtful. Very likely she would choose brown when she was raised. Or perhaps white. She was a rarity in the tower. One of the sea folk, the Atha Anmier. There were only four sea folk eyes to die, all browns, and two of them were almost as old as Gitara had been. Atha Anmier girls never came to the tower unless they manifested the spark or managed to begin learning on their own. In either case, a delegation of sea folk delivered the girl, then left as soon as they could. The Atha Anmier disliked being very long away from salt water, and the nearest sea to Tarvalan lay 400 leagues to the south. Zamila, though, seemed to want to forget her origins. At least, she would never talk about the sea folk unless pressed by an Aes Sedai. And she was diligent, intently focused on earning the shawl from her first day, so Moiraine had heard, though she was not quick to learn. Not slower than most, just not quick. She had been accepted for eight years now, and ten years a novice before that, and Moiraine had seen her fumble a weave time after time before suddenly setting it so perfectly that she wondered why she had failed before. 
but then everyone progressed at her own pace, and the tower never pushed harder than you could go. A tall accepted on the row in front of them, Iceling Noon twisted around. She was almost bouncing on the bench with excitement. It's the foretelling, I say. Gitara had a foretelling before she died, and the armament is going to tell us what it was. You two had the duty this morning, didn't you? You were with her when she died. What did she say? Swan stiffened, and Moiraine opened her mouth to lie, but Tarna saved her. Moiraine told me Gitara didn't have a foretelling, Isley. We'll find out what the Armalyn wants to tell us when she arrives. Her voice was cool, as always, but not cutting. Isling blushed furiously anyway. She was another rarity for the tower. One of the Tuatha'an, the Tinkers. The Tuatha'an lived in garishly painted wagons, traveling from village to village. And like the sea folk, they wanted no self-taught wilders among them. If a band discovered the spark coming out in one of their girls, they turned their train of wagons and headed for Tarvalin as fast as their horses could move. Varen, a stout brown who was even shorter than Warain, said that Tinker Girls never tried to find their way to channeling on their own, that they did not want to channel or become Aes Sedai. It must be so, since Varen had said it, yet Isling applied herself with just as much determination as Zamila, and with more success. She had earned the ring in five years, in the same year as Warain and Swan, and Moiraine thought she might test for the shawl in another year, perhaps less. One of the doors at the back of the dais opened, and Tamra glided out, still in the blue dress she had worn the night before, the Armalyn stole draped around her neck. Moiraine was one of the first to see her, the first to rise, but in moments everyone was on her feet and silent. It seemed strange to see the Armalyn by herself, Always, when Tamra was seen in the corridors, she was accompanied by at least a few Aes Sedai, whether ordinary sisters presenting petitions or sitters in the hall of the tower discussing some matter that was before the hall. She looked weary to Moiraine. Oh, her back was straight, and her expression said she could walk through a wall if she took it in mind, but something about her eyes spoke of tiredness that had little to do with missing sleep. In thanksgiving for the continued safety of Tarvalin, she said, her voice carrying easily to everyone. I have decided the tower will give a bounty of 100 crowns in gold to every woman in the city who bore a child between the day the first soldiers arrived and the day the threat is ended. It is being announced on the streets even as I speak. Everyone knew better than to make a sound while the Armalyn was speaking, Yet that brought a few murmurs, including one from Swan. Actually, hers was more of a grunt. She had never seen ten gold crowns in one place, much less a hundred. A hundred would buy a very large farm, or who knew how many fishing boats. Ignoring the break in the proprieties, Tamra continued without a pause. As some of you may already know, an army is always accompanied by camp followers. Sometimes more camp followers than there are soldiers. Many of these are craftsfolk an army needs. The armorers and fletchers, the blacksmiths and farriers and wagon wrights. But among them are soldiers' wives and other women. Since the army provided the shield to Tarvalin, I have decided to extend the bounty to those women also. Moiraine realized she was biting at her lower lip and made herself stop. It was a habit she was trying to break. There was certainly no point to letting anyone who saw you know that you were thinking furiously. At least now they knew what Tamra was after. She must believe the boy child really would be born soon. But why under the light tell accepted? That threat might continue for some time, Tamra said. Though I have reports this morning that the Aeel may be retreating, yet the situation appears safe enough to begin collecting names, at least in the camps closest to the city. To be fair to those women, we must begin as soon as possible before any of them leave. Some will, if the Aeel really are going. Many of the soldiers will follow the Aeel, soon to be joined by their camp followers, and other soldiers will return to their homes. No sisters have returned to the tower yet, so I am sending all of you to begin taking names. Since inevitably some women will slip away before you find them, 
you also will ask after those who gave birth and can't be found. Write down everything that might help locate them. Who the father is, from what town or village, what country, everything. You will each be accompanied by four tower guards to make sure no one troubles you. Moiraine almost choked trying to keep silent. Astonished gasps rose from women less successful than she. It was rare enough for Accepted to be allowed to leave the city, but without a sister? That was unheard of. With a small indulgent smile, Tamra paused to let order restore itself. She plainly knew she had startled them out of their wits. She also apparently heard something that Moiraine did not catch. As silence fell again, the Amarlin said, If I hear that someone has used the power to defend herself, Alana, that someone will sit very tenderly after a visit to the Mistress of Novices. A few of the accepted were still unsettled enough to giggle, and one or two laughed aloud. Alana was a shy woman at heart, but she worked hard at being fierce. She told anyone who would listen that she wanted to belong to the Green, the Battle Aja, and have a dozen warders. Only Greens bonded more than a single warder. None had that many warders, of course, but that was Alana, always exaggerating. Tamra slapped her palms together, quieting gigglers and laughers alike at a stroke. There were limits to her indulgence. You will all take great care, and heed the soldiers escorting you. There were no smiles now. Her voice was firm. The Amarlin seat brooked no nonsense from rulers. She certainly would not from accepted. The Aiel are not the only danger outside Tarvalin's walls. Some may think you are Aes Sedai, and you may let them so long as you aren't foolish enough to claim that you are. That deepened the stillness. Claiming to be Aes Sedai when you were not violated a tower law that was enforced strictly, even against women who were not initiates of the tower. But there are ruffians who will see only a youthful woman's face. Easy prey, they might think, if not for your escort. Better to remove temptation and avoid the problem altogether. And don't forget that there are children of the light in the army. A white cloak will know an accepted dress when he sees one, and if he can safely put an arrow through her back, it will please him as much as if she were Aes Sedai. It hardly seemed possible the room could grow any quieter, yet it did. Moraine thought she could have heard people breathing, except that no one seemed to be breathing. When an Aes Sedai went out into the world and vanished, as sometimes happened, the first thought was always the White Cloaks. The children called Aes Sedai dark friends, and claimed that touching the One Power was blasphemy punishable by death, a sentence they were all too willing to carry out. No one could understand why they had come to help defend Tarvalin. No one among the accepted, at least. The Amarlin ran her eyes slowly along the rows. At last she gave a nod, satisfied that her warning had sunk in. Horses are being saddled for you at the West Stable. There will be food for midday in the saddlebags and everything else you will need. Now return to your rooms, put on stout shoes, and fetch your cloaks. It will be a long day for you and cold. Go in the light. It was a dismissal and they offered curtsies almost as one, but as they began moving toward the door to the corridor, she added, as though it had just occurred to her, Oh yes, the words jerked everyone to a halt. When you record the woman's name, also put down the infant's name and sex, the day he or she was born, and exactly where. The tower's records must be complete in this matter. You may go. Just as though what she had left till last was not the most important thing. That was how Aes Sedai hid things in plain sight. Some said Aes Sedai had invented the game of houses. Moiraine could not help exchanging excited glances with Swan. Swan absolutely hated anything that smacked of clerical work, but she wore a wide grin. They were going to help find the Dragon Reborn. Just his name, of course, and his mother's name, but it was as near to an adventure as Accepted could dare to hope for. Chapter 4 Leaving the Tower Moiraine's room was little different from Swan's. Her small square table with four books lying on it and the two cushionless straight-backed chairs could have come from the same farmhouse that had provided Swan's. 
Her bed was narrower, her Ileaner carpet round and flowered, and darned in several places, while on her washstand it was the basin that had taken a blow some time in the past. The mirror had a crack in one corner. Apart from that, they could have been the same room. She did not bother with starting a fire. She had banked her coals more carefully than Swan, but there was no time to so much as take the edge off the room's chill. Reaching into the back of her wardrobe, slightly larger than Swan's but just as plain, she brought out a stout pair of shoes that made her grimace. Ugly things, made of leather much thicker than her slippers. The laces could have done tremendous saddle, but the shoes would keep her feet dry in the snow and her slippers would not. Adding a pair of woolen stockings, she sat on the edge of her unmade bed to pull them on over those she was already wearing. For a moment she considered donning a second shift as well. However cold it was inside the tower, it would be colder where she was going. But time was short, and besides, she did not want to take off her dress in that icy air. Surely recording names would be done in some sort of shelter, with a fire or a brazier for warmth? Of course it would. Most people in the camps likely would take them for sisters, just as Tamra had suggested. Next out of the wardrobe came a narrow, worked leather belt with silver buckle and a plain scabbard holding a slim, silver-mounted dagger, its blade a little longer than her hand. She had not worn that since arriving in the tower, and it felt awkward at first, hanging at her waist. Perhaps she was forbidden to use the power to defend herself, but the dagger would do nicely if need be. Transferring her belt pouch from the white leather belt she had laid on the bed, she thought for a moment. It was all very well for Tamra to say that everything they needed would be waiting, but depending on someone else, even the Armalin seat, to provide everything was unwise. She tucked her ivory comb and ivory-handled hairbrush into a leather scrip. No matter how urgent the need to gather names, she doubted that any accepted who let herself go untidy for long would escape sharp words at best. Her good riding gloves, dark blue leather with just a touch of embroidery on the back, followed, plus a small sewing kit in a carved blackwood box, a ball of stout twine, two pairs of spare stockings in case those she was wearing got wet, several kerchiefs in various sizes, and a number of other items that might be useful, including a little knife that folded for trimming quill pens, in the event that was what they found themselves using. Sisters would never be forced to put up with such a convenience, but they were not sisters. Hanging the script from one shoulder, she gathered her cloak with its banded hem and another band bordering the hood, and rushed out just in time to see Maidani and Brendas go scurrying through the doorway that led off the gallery, cloaks flaring behind them. Swan was waiting impatiently, a script on her shoulder too, beneath her cloak, and her blue eyes sparkling with excitement. She was not alone in being caught up in the moment. On the other side of the gallery, Katarina L. Ruddin popped out of her room, demanding at the top of her lungs that Carlinia return her sewing kit, then darted back inside without waiting for an answer. Alana, Pratala, can one of you lend me a pair of clean stockings? Someone called from below. I loaned you a pair yesterday, Edesina, came a reply from above. Doors banged throughout the well as women rushed out to shout for Tamila or Desandra, Coladera or Atuan, or a score of others to return this or that borrowed item or lend something. Had a sister been present, the cacophony would put them all in the soup kettle to their necks on a hot fire. What kept you, Moraine? Swan said breathlessly. Come on, before we're left behind. She set off at a rapid stride, as though she really expected the guardsmen to be gone if they did not hurry. There was no chance of that, of course, but Moiraine did not dawdle. She was not about to drag her feet at a chance to leave the city, especially not at this chance. Outside, the sun was still well short of halfway to its noonday peak. Thickening dark grey clouds rolled across the sky. They might have more snowfall today. That would not make the task ahead any easier. The walk was easy, since the wide, graveled path through the trees that led to the west stable beyond the tower wing that held the Accepted's quarters had been cleared. Not for the convenience of the Accepted, of course. Most of the sisters kept their horses in the west stable, and workmen shoveled that path clean two or three times a day if necessary. The stable itself was three sprawling stories of grey stone, 
larger than the main stables of the Sun Palace, the wide, stone-paved stable yard in front of it almost filled by a crowd of rough-coated grooms and saddled horses and helmeted tower guards who wore gray steel breastplates over nearly black coats and equally dark cloaks worked with a white teardrop of the flame of Tarvalon. Seven striped tabards over the breastplates marked out Bannerman and the lone officer. Brendas and Maidani were climbing into their saddles, and half a dozen other accepted, cloaked and hooded in a strung out line, were already riding toward the sunset gate, surrounded by their guards. Moiraine felt a moment of irritation that so many had beaten her and Swan down. Had they packed nothing to be so quick? But they did not know what they really were looking for. That buoyed her spirits again. Pushing through the crowd, she found her bay mare, the reins held by a lanky groom with a disapproving expression on her narrow face. Very likely, she frowned on an accepted having her own horse. Few did. Most could not afford to keep a horse. And besides, opportunities to ride anywhere outside the tower grounds were rare. But Moiraine had purchased Arrow to celebrate attaining the ring. An act of ostentation that she suspected had nearly earned her a trip to Marian's study. She did not regret the purchase even so. The mare was not tall, since she despised looking like a child, which she did on tall animals, yet Arrow could keep running long after larger horses had tired out. A fast mount was good, but a mount with endurance was better. Arrow was both. And she could jump fences that few other horses would even try. Finding that out had earned a visit to the Mistress of Novices. Sisters took a dim view of accepted risking a broken neck. A very dim view. The groom tried to hand her the reins, but she hung the script from the saddle's tall pommel by its strap, then unbuckled the flaps of the saddlebags. One side held a cloth-wrapped parcel that proved to contain half a loaf of dark bread, dried apricots in oiled paper, and a large piece of pale yellow cheese. More than she could eat by herself, but some of the others had larger appetites. The other side bulged with a polished wooden lap desk complete with a thick sheaf of good paper and two good steel-nibbed pens inside. No need for the penknife, she thought ruefully, careful to keep her face smooth. She did not intend to let the groom see her look abashed. At least she had been prepared. The lap desk also held a tightly stoppered ink jar of heavy glass. Much to the groom's undisguised amusement, she checked to make sure it was tightly stoppered. Well, the woman could snicker all she wanted, not bothering to hide it behind a hand, but she would not have had to deal with the mess if the...